With regard to the rebuilding of the tabernacle of David, the passage we want to understand is Acts 15, verses 14 through 17. This is an important passage, yet it is often misinterpreted. Of first importance is knowing what the tabernacle of David is. And of course, we want to know why it needs to be rebuilt and when it is to be rebuilt. So our study will hopefully provide an answer to these questions and beyond that, grant us an insight into the mighty work of God, bringing us to adore and praise Him. But before we even talk about Acts 15, 14 through 17, we're going to go way back to the first mention of this tabernacle in the Old Testament. We want to compare David's tabernacle to the tabernacle that Moses built and see what place the Ark of the Covenant played in each one. Then we will work our way forward to Acts 15, where we find the fulfillment of the tabernacle of David toward which the rest of Scripture moves. So let's do it. We will start with the Ark of God. It is also known as the Ark of the Covenant and by several other names. The instructions for making of the Ark are found in Exodus 25. It was an object about four feet long by two and a half feet wide by two and a half feet tall and made of acacia wood. It was covered inside and out with gold, showing that it had high value. It had four rings of gold on the sides at the corners. There were poles also overlaid with gold that went inside the rings on each side. They were used to carry the ark and were not to be removed. One of the items that would go into the ark was the tablets of the Ten Commandments. The top of the ark was the mercy seat. At each end of it, facing each other and overlooking the mercy seat, were two cherubim. Their wings were stretched forward, covering the mercy seat. The mercy seat and the cherubim were made of solid gold. But this is the most important thing to remember about the ark. It symbolized the presence of God. It was where God would meet with the people. The ark was only one piece, albeit the most important piece, of the furnishings of what was known as the tabernacle of Moses. As with the ark, God gave Moses very specific instructions about the tabernacle that would house the ark of the covenant. Everything was to be made exactly as God had specified, and each item was to be made from the specific material God chose. Nothing was left to the design of men. Later, when we consider more closely the tabernacle of David, we will want to compare it with the tabernacle of Moses. So let us consider the elaborate makeup of Moses' tabernacle. It measured about 75 feet wide by 150 feet long. It was surrounded by a 7.5 foot tall curtain with supports. There was an outer court with two furnishings, a bronze altar for sacrifices, and a bronze laver for cleaning. At the end of the court was a 15-foot by 45-foot wooden building overlaid with gold. This was the tabernacle proper. It was divided into two compartments. The first and largest room was 15 feet by 30 feet and was called the holy place. Inside it were three items, the lampstand, the table of showbread, and the altar of incense. All of these were golden. The next room, 15 feet by 15 feet, was the holy of holies. Inside it was where the most important item was placed. And of course, this was the Ark of the Covenant, where the presence of God dwelled. Everything in the tabernacle of Moses had a function. The one thing I'm trying to point out for our purposes is that the tabernacle of Moses was a very elaborate layout built according to the dictates of God. God was very precise in what he wanted and how it was to be put together. Thus, at this time, the Ark of the Covenant, where God would dwell and meet with the people, was housed in and was the most important furnishing in the Tabernacle of Moses. So how did the Ark get from the Tabernacle of Moses to the Tabernacle of David? Well, it wasn't easy, and it took several hundred years. Though the Tabernacle of Moses, with all its furnishings, was quite large and elaborate, it had to be portable. During this time in the wilderness, God led the Israelites in a cloud and in a fire. When the cloud or fire moved, the people packed up the tabernacle and moved with it. There were strict guidelines for moving the tabernacle, and in particular, the Ark of the Covenant. Now after Moses died, Joshua was the leader. They crossed over the Jordan River and invaded the land of Canaan, with the Ark leading the way. 
and the ark was involved in the defeat of the city of Jericho. During the subjugation of the land, the Israelites were camped at Gilgal. Thus the tabernacle was set up there. Later the tabernacle was set up in Shiloh. This is where it would stay while Israel was ruled through the judges. Now about 300 plus years later, the Israelites are warring against the Philistines and losing. So the elders have this idea. They decide to go to Shiloh and get the ark to help them in battle. This is where the ark gets separated from the tabernacle of Moses. The Israelites take the ark into battle and lose again. The ark is captured by the Philistines. This is sort of funny. I've got to be brief. The Philistines take the ark to Ashdod and set it by their god Dagon. Dagon falls down before the ark a few nights in a row and breaks himself. And all the people of Ashdod get hemorrhoids. They take the ark to other cities and they get hemorrhoids too and some people are dying. King James Version puts it discreetly in 1 Samuel 5, 9. They had emeralds in their secret parts. These folks decide they don't want the ark, so they send it back to Israel. You can read the whole story in 1 Samuel chapters 4 through 6. For most of the remainder of the time before David would go to get it and put it in his tabernacle, the ark was located in kirjath Jerem. When the time came that David had consolidated his kingdom, he decided to go down to kirjath Jerem, get the ark, and bring it up to Jerusalem. This event is recorded in 2 Samuel 6 and also 1 Chronicles chapters 13, 15, and 16. I'm going to refer to the count in 1 Chronicles as there is a little more detail there. In 1 Chronicles 13, David has gathered a large number of people together at kirjath Jerem and bring the ark up. They put it on a newly built cart and take off. However, the cattle pulling the cart stumble and the ark is in danger of tipping over. A man, Uzzah, reaches up to steady the ark and God kills him. This brings an end to the journey at that point. David is upset and afraid. The ark is left at the house of Obed-Edom and everybody goes home. For the next three months, the ark stays with Obed-Edom and God just blesses him left and right. The story is picked up again in 1 Chronicles 15. Verse 1 records that David prepares a place for the ark and pinches for it a tent. Tent, tabernacle, the same thing. This is the tabernacle of David where the ark of God will now be housed. Up until now, David had not prepared a place for the ark. In the three months that had passed since David had initially sought to bring the ark to Jerusalem, he did something really wise. He had apparently gone to the scripture and brushed up on the proper way of doing it. The Levites were to carry the ark. Remember that it had rings near its four corners and two staves or poles that went through those rings? In that manner, the ark was to be carried by the Levites. In the first attempt, they had obtained a new cart for the purpose of carrying the ark. But now David confesses that they had not obeyed God in doing this properly. So God had been displeased and put an end to their original and improper effort. There was something that was unique in the travel of the ark, both in the initial attempt when the ark came from kirjath Jerem on the cart, and again when it came from Obed-Edom's home. In the first attempt, it is recorded that David and Israel played before the Lord with all their might, and with singing, harps, psalteries, timbrels, cymbals, and trumpets. In the final trip, David instructed the Levites to oversee the musical ministry and to appoint singers and musicians. And so there was all sorts of music and praise made to the Lord. The people were rejoicing before God. David was so happy, it is recorded in 1 Chronicles 15, 29, that he was dancing. Can you imagine that, the king of Israel out in the midst of the people dancing? And thus it was that the ark came to Jerusalem, the city of David. 1 Chronicles 16, 1 tells us that they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for it. It was that simple. David put up a tent tabernacle and in the middle of it he placed the ark of God. There was nothing else. All the furnishings that were in the tabernacle of Moses used for sacrifices were missing. Now in all this it is apparent that the ark is much more important than the tabernacle. The tabernacle exists for the ark. The ark does not exist for the tabernacle. When the ark had found its new home in David's tabernacle, there were burnt sacrifices and peace offerings that were made to the Lord. 
But these were not for atonement, and they came to an end. David blessed the people in the name of the Lord and gave them food and drink. Then he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark. Their duty was to keep in remembrance the Lord and give thanks and praise to him. Much of the rest of this chapter is a psalm that David then sang before the Lord. It is a psalm of praise, encouraging all to give thanks to God for his marvelous works, to obey him and make known his glory. Portions of it are found in Psalm 96, 105, and 106. Now there are two things regarding the ark that we have made note of here. I want to consider them further. First, the ark, which had been absent from the tabernacle of Moses, is not returned to that tabernacle. One would think that David would take it and put it where it belonged. After all, there were instructions from God about this. But David has taken the ark, the presence of God, and placed it in a totally different place of his own making. It is now residing in the middle of a one-room tent. There are no other furnishings with it. Contrast this to its former location in the tabernacle of Moses. That tabernacle was much more sophisticated, containing several items, elegant and all having purposes. It was as if the Ark of the Covenant had gone from a palace to a shack. It was now there all alone in the middle of David's tabernacle. Second, consider the activity around the two tabernacles. In the tabernacle of Moses, the Ark of the Covenant was contained in the Holy of Holies. It was totally out of reach to anyone but the high priest. And it was open to him only once a year when he would go into it with the blood of the animal sacrifice. But with the tabernacle of David, the ark of God was not hidden in an inaccessible place. Sacrifices of animals ceased. In their place was the sound of praise, thanksgiving, music, and song with joy and delight in the Lord. God was approached continually with hearts of gratitude and adoration. All the people were involved in this activity before the Lord, and not just a single man or a select group of men. The heartfelt worship that broke out into praise and song at the tabernacle of David was nothing that had ever happened before in Israel. Earlier we saw that when the Ark of the Covenant was transported in the wrong way, it angered God and a man died. Yet now we see the Ark in a different tent rather than in its God-ordained place in the tabernacle of Moses. It is in Jerusalem and not in Gibeon. The activity going on around it is not the solemn slaughter of animals for offerings, but rather we've got people singing and rejoicing and delighting in God. Whereas there was chapter after chapter of instructions for the tabernacle of Moses, where's the command of God for this change? Has David taken it upon himself to institute a new worship? Can we not expect God to be angry and begin to deal out some form of deadly judgment? Well, if we had nothing else, I think we could be sure that David was acting properly because of later prophets who would refer to the tabernacle of David in a positive way. However, I think there is further proof that David was acting under the commandment of God. When Hezekiah, one of the last kings of Judah, instituted his reforms, it is recorded in 2 Chronicles 29, verse 25, that he set the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, with psalteries, and with harps, according to the commandment of David and of Gad the king's seer and Nathan the prophet. For so was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. Although this is referring to the temple, which David was not allowed to build, the activities of the Levites are the same as they were at the tabernacle of David. Also, David had godly men around him who directed him in the will of God. Two are mentioned here, Gad and Nathan. Yet there could have also been others. David himself, according to this scripture, had the authority to issue such a command. Thus David was not acting outside the will of God in all that he did with regard to his tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant and the worship that was performed in the presence of God. So with what we now know about the tabernacle of David, let's define it in a more concise way. It was not an elaborate building, but rather a simple tent-like structure or covering that David made to house the ark or the presence of God. David, more than anything, wanted the presence of God. God made David happy. David's psalms are often about his desire for the Lord. In God's presence, David found fullness of joy and everlasting pleasure. The thing he desired above all was to behold the beauty of Christ. His heart rejoiced in the Lord, and the purpose of his songs was to praise him. The importance of David's tabernacle was that it was a place for the ark or the presence of God. David wanted God with him. The tabernacle of Moses was too far away. 
being in Gibeon. And in that tabernacle, the presence of God would be put out of reach in the Holy of Holies. David wanted God with him in Jerusalem, and he wanted God accessible at all times. God put that in David's heart, and God was honored by David's desire. You see, God was pleased to dwell in a simple place if he was really wanted there. David made provision for the continuation of the proper ministry at the tabernacle of Moses in Gibeon. In about 35 years, Solomon, after David's death, would build the temple and the furnishings of Moses' tabernacle, as well as the Ark of the Covenant in David's tabernacle, would be moved into and reunited in the temple. So we leave all that behind us now. The next time that the tabernacle of David is mentioned by that name is in Isaiah 16:5, And in mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment and hastening righteousness. This verse is interpreted in various ways, many thinking it has a double reference. But most all agree that ultimately the he that sits on the throne that is in the tabernacle of David is the Lord Jesus Christ. There are a number of things worth mentioning here. This is a prophecy that will be in the future from the time of Isaiah. When this throne is established, it will be in a time of mercy. The throne itself will be in the tabernacle of David. In the original tabernacle of David, there was no throne, just the ark. But the ark represented the presence of God. It appears the ark is replaced by the throne, and upon the throne will be Christ, the second person of the Trinity. He will be judging, seeking justice, and doing righteousness. Now that we have seen this prophecy that Christ is going to sit on the throne of David, and this throne is going to be in the tabernacle of David, we need to return to 1 Chronicles chapter 17. David has been talking to his counselor and prophet of God, Nathan. He tells Nathan that he wants to build God a house, and he is referring to the temple. But the thing of interest to us is that Nathan tells David that God is going to build David a house. Now, it must be understood that God is not going to build David a literal house in which he can live. This should become evident as we look at this in other passages. God is telling David that he is going to build him a dynasty or a lineage. Verse 11 is very important because it tells us when it is going to happen. It will happen when David's days are expired and he goes to be with his fathers. This means it will happen when David is dead and in the grave with his ancestors. It will be before the resurrection when David and all others are brought back to life from the grave. This is very important and you must remember this. Hey, this is important. If you were being tested, this would be on the exam. At some point, while David is dead, God will raise up David's seed, which will be from one of his sons. This seed cannot be Solomon or any of David's offspring who were kings in the physical kingdom before it was destroyed. That lineage had a break in it when the kingdom came to an end. We know this because verse 14 tells us that when God establishes the throne, it will be forever. There will not be a break. Verse 12 has extremely important information as well. This seed shall build God a house. We know that Solomon did build a literal house, the temple of Solomon, for God. But Solomon's temple cannot be the house that God is referring to here. It was destroyed by the Babylonians at the same time the lineage of Judean kings ended. Furthermore, we have it from numerous places that God does not dwell in man-made temples. The house or kingdom that God is going to build for David will be spiritual, not physical. Now when David hears this news, he is humbled and makes known his gratitude to God. He prays that God will keep his promise and establish his house forever, that the name of the Lord might forever be magnified. There is no question who this seed is who is in the lineage of David. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is evident from many passages in the scriptures. For instance, the angel Gabriel tells Mary that her unborn child, Jesus, will be given the throne of David by God, and over his kingdom he will rule forever. That is Luke 1, 31 through 33. Let's summarize what we learn from Isaiah 16, 5 with what we learn from 1 Chronicles 17. In Isaiah 16, 5, the throne will be established in a time of mercy. The throne will be inside the tabernacle of David. 
He who sits on the throne will be judging, seeking justice, and doing righteousness. In 1 Chronicles 17, we learn that God is going to build David a house or dynasty. It will happen while David is in the grave and thus before the resurrection. The one that will build the house will be in the lineage of David. God will establish that one's kingdom and his throne forever. And that one will build a house for God. It is without question that both of these passages are prophesying what Jesus Christ will do. Now when it is said in Isaiah 16:5 that the throne is in the tabernacle of David, it seems strange if we think of this as a throne in a literal tent. The passage in 1 Chronicles 17 helps to clarify what this really means. The throne is going to be kept in David's lineage in the kingdom that God is going to establish. Perhaps this will become clear as we look at the next passage where the tabernacle of David is spoken of. And that passage is Amos chapter 9 verses 11 and 12. In 1 Chronicles 17 we were given information that helps us know when God would build David a house or dynasty. It would be during the time that David was dead. Now here in Amos 9:11 we are again given information regarding the time when God will raise up the tabernacle of David. It will be in that day. Isn't that helpful? Well, yeah, it is. All we have to do is read what Amos wrote just prior to this to see what day, or actually what time period, he was referring to. In previous chapters, including chapter 9, Amos is prophesying the coming judgment upon Israel. His ministry was during the time of Jeroboam II, was king in northern ten tribes, and Isaiah was king in Judah. This would have been around 750 B.C. We can get the drift of his message from the two previous verses, 9 and 10. God says that he is going to sift the house of Israel among all the nations. They are going to be shaken together, mixed up. In other words, they are going to be removed from the land and scattered among all the other people. There is a number of them who are living in false confidence, and God says they are going to die by the sword. This is just a sample of the judgments that Amos has been prophesying. In summary, we can say that the judgment is coming on the people and they are going to be conquered and carried away. So when we come to Amos 9.11 and he says, In that day, we can know that it will be in a time that Israel has been defeated and scattered. It will no longer be functioning as a sovereign nation in its own land. It would be during that time that God will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen. Shortly, the northern ten tribes of Israel will be conquered by the Assyrians, and about 130 years after that, Judah and Benjamin in the south will fall to Babylon. The Israelite kingdom will then be ended. Now it is also clear that during the time that Amos is prophesying, the tabernacle of David had already fallen. This is not a reference to the literal tent that David had made to house the ark. This is a reference to the fallen house or lineage of David. All the love for God and the proper worship has been forsaken by David's descendants and the majority of the people. They have turned to other gods and forsaken the pursuit of justice and righteousness. In the southern kingdom there will be times of revival, but the pursuit of God and the joy and the delight of knowing him like David did when he had the presence of God in his tabernacle, will never again be reached before the destruction of the nation. Amos also says that the tabernacle is going to be set up as it was in the days of old. We have to remember that in the day that Amos is prophesying, the temple of Solomon is still standing. But when David set up his tabernacle, there was no temple. That was the days of old to Amos. And we need to remember, too, that the building of the temple was strictly David's idea. God let his son, Solomon, build it. But God had another place, another kind of temple he desired to dwell in. We will see this as we continue. It is probably best that we defer comment on the rest of this prophecy at this time. Let's go now to the chapter that contains the central passage that we want to deal with. It quotes this passage in Amos. Let's move to Acts 15. Now Acts 15 records a conference that took place in Jerusalem in the early days of the church. Initially the church was made up of Jewish believers, but all of a sudden Gentiles were being converted and coming into the church. 
This was a big surprise even to the apostles and other church leaders. But the problem was that some Jewish believers were saying that it was necessary for these new Gentile converts to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. Others thought this unnecessary. The dispute required the apostles and elders of the church to gather, discuss, and decide what was appropriate. At this conference, there was much disagreement and argument, but at one point, the apostle Peter stood up and said something like this, Hey guys, you know that God chose that the Gentiles should hear the gospel from me and believe. He has given them the Holy Spirit just like he did to us, and there is no difference in the way we come. Whether Jew or Gentile, we come to Christ our Savior by faith. So why do we want to load them up with all the stuff we could never do? It is by the grace of the Lord Jesus that we and them are saved. Those were mighty words, and this was a showstopper. All those involved quieted down. Then the Apostle Paul and Barnabas were allowed to tell of the wondrous things they had seen God do in their ministries among the Gentiles. And after they finished speaking, James, the half-brother of Jesus and leader of the Jerusalem church, spoke. And finally, we are to the central passage of our study. And James says this, Simeon hath declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Now it is here that we see James mention the tabernacle of David as he quotes from the prophet Amos. But before discussing this tabernacle, it would be appropriate to say that the result of this conference in Jerusalem was that the Gentiles were placed under no obligation to be circumcised or keep the law of Moses. Letters were written to the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia stating something like this, Brethren, there are those who have troubled you saying that you have got to be circumcised. You have got to keep the law of... No, no, no. We have never given such a commandment. The Holy Spirit and us leaders lay no burden on you but to abstain from these four things, meat offered to idols, blood, things strangled, and fornication. Press on with Jesus. So the Gentile believers had no need to submit themselves to the law of Moses or those of the Jews who would place them in bondage to rules and rituals that were outdated or traditional. In his letter to the twelve tribes, James refers to the law of liberty as that law to which believers are to submit. In James 1.25 he says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Again in James 2.12 he states, so speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Now this law of liberty is related to the royal law that James mentions in chapter 2 and verse 8. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. This law of liberty and royal law is connected to the law of Christ that Paul spoke of in Galatians 6 2 when he said, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now I recognize I'm getting a little off track here, but this Old Testament law-keeping thing forever needs to be addressed. Do not be in bondage to anyone who says you need to do something like uh, observe the Sabbath. Don't fall for that kind of thing. You are to observe all things that Jesus Christ has commanded you, as stated in Matthew 28.20. Just remember this, with the rebuilding of the tabernacle of David, the law of Moses is out. Gentiles were never subjected to the law of Moses anyway, and this council confirmed that it was going to stay that way. The law of Christ, or the royal law, or the law of liberty is in. Okay, back to verses 14 and 15. The church leaders are coming to understand that God is doing something that he previously had not done. 
He is going out to all the Gentiles, all the nations outside of the Jews. And from all these other nations, he is going to take out a people for his name. Then James says in verse 15, This is in agreement with the words of the prophets. The Old Testament prophets predicted this. And then James quotes as an example of the Old Testament prophets the verse we have previously noted in Amos 9, 11, and 12. James begins with the words, After this. This is different than Amos 9, 11, which begins, In that day. Why the difference? As we noted previously, Amos was looking into the future when the tabernacle of David would be set up. It would be in that day when judgment had come upon Israel and God would sift the house of Israel among all the nations. Or in other words, they would be scattered among the nations. Between the time that Amos wrote the prophecy and the time that James is quoting it, that event had happened. Israel had been conquered and were scattered among other nations. James was living in that day or in that time period when it was reality. For that reason, James could say, after this, or after this dispersion, I will return, etc. The reason this is important to see is because the dispensationalists deny that the prophecy is being fulfilled. They claim that what James is quoting from Amos is still going to be future. They believe that James is saying that after this, after the Gentiles get into the church, I will return. But that is not what Amos or James is saying. Both understand that it is after the Jews are conquered and scattered among the nations, I will return, and so on. James has just said the words of the prophets agree that God is going to take out from the Gentiles a people for his name. This is made clear also by Amos 9.12, which is quoted here in verse 17. You might want to look at translations of this verse other than King James. They may make it more clear to you. But James says here, my paraphrase, that the remnant of mankind might seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who call upon my name, says the Lord who does all these things. This is an opportune time to make mention of a few other verses in Acts that would be good to bring in here. I'm thinking of Acts chapter 2, verses 29, 30, and 31. This, of course, is Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. One of the things that is interesting is that Peter points out to his audience, and his audience is Jewish here, that truth that we saw previously in 1 Chronicles 17.11. He says, Look, see, you know David is dead and buried, and right now you can check out his grave. Remember in 1 Chronicles 17.11, we saw that the prophecy was that when David was in the grave, God would raise up his seed, that being Christ, and would also establish his kingdom. The kingdom is to be established while David is in the grave. It is not going to be established in some future premillennialist or dispensationalist millennium after the resurrection. In that case, David would be resurrected, not in the grave. While we're here, look at what Jesus said. John 18:36. This is when Pilate is asking him about being king of the Jews. What does Jesus say? He says, my kingdom is not of this world. Now memorize that. Christ's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. It is not of this world. What is the kingdom of God? Romans 14, 17 tells you not only what it is, but what it is not. First, it is not eating and drinking. You may remember when David set up his tabernacle and put the ark in it that he gave everybody a loaf of bread, a chunk of meat, and a bottle of wine, or something like that. But Romans 14, 7 tells us that the kingdom of God is not about those physical things. It is about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Do you practice righteousness and have peace and joy in the Holy Spirit? If you do... You are in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not some far-off physical kingdom where Jews rule the world. If you just look in the book of Acts alone, you will find that the kingdom of God is mentioned several times. That is what they were preaching. You get into the kingdom by repentance and faith in the king, Jesus Christ. Acts 19.8 Paul is in the synagogue in Ephesus. For three months he argued with the Jews about the kingdom of God. 
Do you think he was trying to convince them that thousands of years later, the Jews would get their physical kingdom back? No. He was preaching Jesus Christ as king. The kingdom had come. When we think of David, we probably think of him first and foremost as the king of Israel. But Acts 2.30 presents him as a prophet. You may recall that many of his psalms are prophetic. But in this verse, we are told that David knew that God was going to raise up Christ. And what is the reason given here as to why God would raise him up? It was so that he, Christ, would sit on his, David's, throne. God raises Christ up in order that he could sit on the throne of David. Now I think that there is abundance of evidence from what we have seen in this study to assure us that Christ is seated on his throne right now. We just saw that the kingdom of God is present now. If God has a kingdom, he must have a king. A kingdom presupposes a king. But the dispensationalists say that the kingdom is future, and so Jesus doesn't sit on the throne of David until sometime in the future. So let's find some scripture that will enable us to make a quick and concise judgment that Jesus is reigning now. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 24 through 26. Now this speaks of the end, a time when Christ delivers up the kingdom to his Father. Christ is reigning until all rule and authority and power has been made subject to him. In verse 25, the Apostle Paul then quotes Psalm 110.1, stating that Christ must reign until all enemies are put under his feet. He is reigning in a time that there are still enemies to be conquered. But what will be the last enemy to be conquered so that we will know that it is the end? Verse 26 tells us, The last enemy that Christ will have to conquer is death. When death is conquered, we are at the end. And when is death conquered? At the resurrection. And when is the resurrection? On the last day. John records the conversation between Jesus and Martha about Lazarus being raised. Martha understood when the resurrection would occur. She said, I know that Lazarus will be raised on the last day. In John chapter 6, verse 39, Jesus says this about three times in chapter 6. All the ones the Father gives me, I will raise up on the last day. You will be raised up on the last day. I will be raised on the last day. King David will be raised on the last day. But now, while he is still in the grave, God has fulfilled his promise to him by restoring the tabernacle of David and putting his seed, Jesus Christ, on the throne. And he will reign until all his enemies have been defeated. Now this seems pretty clear to me. But the dispensationalist will say that there are different resurrections or two or three stages of one resurrection. But that is how they operate. They have to create a gap or a secret rapture or different resurrections to make their system work. I spent over 40 years trying to make it work and never could. So I tend to get bothered by it now. Jesus is reigning now. He is conquering enemies left and right. At one time, I was an enemy of Christ, but I have been delivered from the power of darkness, as it says in Colossians 1.13, and have been put into the kingdom of Christ. I would say a lot more about this, but i got to move on. Now let's remember a difference between the tabernacle of Moses and the tabernacle of David. In the tabernacle of Moses, the Ark of the Covenant, or the presence of God, was kept in the Holy of Holies where the people had no access to it. But in the tabernacle of David, the presence of God was not hidden away. All who had a heart to delight, adore, rejoice, praise, give thanks, sing unto the Lord in his presence, could do so. Through his tabernacle, David gave the people access to God without the trappings of the Mosaic priesthood. But David's tabernacle was only a physical shadow of what was to come. The reality would be the spiritual kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. When God promised to rebuild the tabernacle of David, he was saying that he would no longer be hidden in the Jewish Old Testament. He would provide access to himself to all peoples who would call on the name of the Lord. The next three words in verse 16 are also used by the dispensationalists to advance their view that the tabernacle of David will not be built until the second coming of Christ. The I will return 
is used as proof that it happens when Jesus Christ comes back in his glory. It is not necessary to understand the verse in that manner, however. The Greek word used here is not the normal word used in the New Testament for return. The word here is anastrepho and is translated return only here and in Acts 5.22. There is another Greek word, hupostrepho, that is normally translated as return in the New Testament. That word is translated that way something like 30 times or thereabouts. But the anastrepho in this verse can be translated overturn or turn about or turn back. If we translate the word as I will turn back, as it is done in Young's literal translation, it makes it easier to understand. It is clear then that this is not talking about the second coming of Christ. It is likely referring to his turning back from the judgment that he has inflicted on Israel by scattering them among the nations because of their sins, and now in mercy setting up the tabernacle of David for their benefit and the benefit of the Gentiles. Now we understand that after he punishes the nation Israel for their sins by scattering them among the nations, God is going to turn back or turn about from that and he is going to rebuild the tabernacle of David. Now God never said that he would rebuild the tabernacle of Moses. Why is that? The tabernacle of Moses was a shadow of the work that Jesus Christ would accomplish for his people at Calvary. You can read all about the shadow of Moses' tabernacle and its fulfillment by the Lord in Hebrews 9. But just as a summary, we can look at verse 24 there. It says that Christ did not enter into the holy places made with hands, that is, Moses' tabernacle. That was just a figure, a shadow of the true one in heaven. Jesus, our high priest, would enter into the real, the heavenly one, to appear in the presence of God for us. So the tabernacle of Moses does not get rebuilt. Jesus is the fulfillment of all it represented when he offered himself as a supreme sacrifice at Calvary and then appeared in the true holy place in the presence of his Father. But the tabernacle of David is a shadow or picture of a true tabernacle that is to be fulfilled in another way. David's tabernacle pictured the presence of God among his people and their joy, praise, and thanksgiving for the blessings of God to them. It superseded the tabernacle of Moses. Christ's fulfillment of the tabernacle of Moses, his redemptive work for his people, brings the presence of God to them. And with the presence of God, as David said, is fullness of joy. Now you remember David's tabernacle was just a tent or some kind of similar covering. It housed the Ark of the Covenant or the presence of God. So we should expect the tabernacle that is being rebuilt to also house the presence of God. Let's review a passage we looked at earlier, 1 Chronicles 17, verses 10 through 14. We saw that God was promising to build David a house or a dynasty, and this would be through his seed while David was in the grave. David's seed, whom we know to be the Lord Jesus Christ, would build God a house, and God, the Father, would establish Christ's throne forever. What is the house that Christ would build? It would be the same as the rebuilt tabernacle of David. The house is where God would dwell. The rebuilt tabernacle of David is where God would dwell. In other pictures in the New Testament, the temple of believers is where God would dwell. You can see that in such verses as 1 Corinthians 3.16. You, plural, that is, all of you, or y'all if you're from the deep south, you all, collectively, are the temple of God. Look at the picture Paul paints for us in Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 19 through 22. He talks about believers being fellow citizens. Citizenship speaks of being in a kingdom. We are of the household of God. We are a part of God's family. But then he says we are building material. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone and the apostles and prophets are the foundation. But believers are framed together to be a holy temple of the Lord. We are built together to be a habitation of God by his spirit. God has a temple. We are it. He dwells in us. 
Do I need to tell you what a privilege that is? Who would ever have dreamed that the God of all creation would take for himself members of fallen mankind and through a miraculous work make them his habitation? Unheard of. But look at what is written in Psalm 46, verses 4 and 5. There is a city of God. That city is a holy place where there are tabernacles of God the Most High. That's tabernacles, plural. The picture here is that God's city contains many tabernacles or dwelling places. God dwells in the midst of this city in multiple tabernacles. Of course, we know that these tabernacles to be individual believers, just as we see in 1 Corinthians 6.19. Each individual believer is pictured as the temple of the Holy Spirit. A picture similar to Psalm 46 is found in John 14. John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. Now most everyone thinks this is about Jesus coming back in the future for believers, but it is not. Verse 2. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, or rooms, as most translations put it. King James has mansions, and that is totally wrong. I don't know where they got that. This Greek word, mone, is used only here in this verse and in verse 23 in this same chapter where it is translated abode. But here the picture is a house that has many rooms or dwelling places. The house would be the equivalent of the city of God in Psalm 46. The rooms or dwelling places in John 14 would be the equivalent to the tabernacles of Psalm 46. But in verse 3 of John 14... Jesus tells the disciples that he is going to come again to receive them to himself. Now this is not about the second coming. What's it about then, you ask? Thank you. It is about the coming of the Holy Spirit as much of the rest of the chapter shows. Look at verses 16 through 18. Jesus tells them that the Father is going to send them another comforter to be with them forever. This comforter is the spirit of truth, and he is going to dwell in them. And then Jesus says that he will not leave them comfortless, but he will come to them. Jesus is coming to them in the person of his spirit. And of course, this is true of every believer. Jesus dwells in us in the person of his spirit. In this picture, we are a room in the Father's house, but not an empty room. The spirit of God comes to dwell in us. And that is how Jesus comes to us. I find this so good it's hard to stop. I'll just read a few more verses in this chapter. I think you will see the connection. Uh, verse 20. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Think about that. Verse 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we, both the Father and the Son, will come unto him and make our abode. This abode is the same word as in verse 2, dwelling place or room. The Father and the Son are going to make their abode, their dwelling place, with him. Okay, another thing we've got to discuss. Mount Zion. Mount Zion was an enemy stronghold that David conquered in his day. 2 Samuel 5, verse 7, tells us that it is also known as the city of David. Now this Mount Zion is the place where David put his tabernacle. Later on in Psalm 2, we have a prophecy of the first coming of Christ, and in verse 6, we have these words, God speaking, Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And if you look through the Old Testament, you will see that there are a large number of references to Zion or Mount Zion. Looking carefully, you should find that a lot of these references are to be interpreted spiritually rather than physically. Such is the case with Psalm 2.6. Let's look at Hebrews 12.22 and find out where believers in Christ have gone. I mean, where they go when they become believers. It says here, you are come, not you will come. You are come 
to Mount Zion, which is the city of the living God, which is the heavenly Jerusalem. You have arrived. This is the place where God has set his king, Jesus Christ. Do you recall chapter 2 of Ephesians, verse 6? We have been raised up right now and are sitting in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Look, people, know where you live. It is in the city of the living God. It is in the stronghold of Zion. It is in the heavenly Jerusalem. And Jesus has been set up as king here. He is ruling. Now let's look at one of the Old Testament prophecies about Mount Zion. Look at Isaiah chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, so we can see a few things about it. You notice that it has dwelling places. Interesting. Now upon every dwelling place and every assembly of those dwelling places, there is a defense. There is a cloud and smoke by day, and in the night there is the shining of a flaming fire. There is a tabernacle there. It is a place of refuge. It protects from the heat of the day and from storm and from rain. All this on Mount Zion, the city of David, the city of the living God, New Jerusalem. What should be considered is that this place of safety and security, this defense, will not be needed in eternity after Jesus Christ has defeated all enemies. But it is needed now for his people. This is a defense and place of safety such that, and I'm quoting from Romans 8:38 and 39, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Beloved, if God allows all the hordes of hell to break out against you and you are hauled off to your death, you are safe and secure in your eternal home. The Spirit of God will not leave you. You can never be forsaken. Your death will simply be an exit from this body of sin that separates you from fully beholding the glory of God. Lose everything this world has to offer, but you will never lose the love of God and all the blessings and heavenly places he has stored up for you. Earlier I mentioned that even though God had promised to rebuild the tabernacle of David, he had never promised to rebuild the tabernacle of Moses. Another thing he has never promised to rebuild is the temple of Solomon, or even the second temple, or the second third temple of Ezra Herod, depending on how you want to number these things. Dispensationalists resort to Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48 as proof that another Jewish temple will be rebuilt. But there are other interpretations that carry more weight than theirs. Much of this could be a shadow of a spiritual fulfillment, but there's no time to go into that now. Or it could be Ezekiel was prophesying of the second temple. Ezra records in his book, chapter 6 and verse 14, that they built it according to the commandment of the God of Israel. These instructions on how to build the thing could be what Ezekiel was giving. Whatever, the book of Hebrews destroys the idea that God is interested in another man-made temple. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 6, in the surrounding context, he makes it clear that the old covenant burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin don't do anything for him. And God has made it clear in so many places, including Acts chapter 6 and verse 48, that he just doesn't live in temples made with hands. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there's not going to be a temple built in Jerusalem sometime in the future. Maybe there will, maybe there won't. I have no idea, but it wouldn't surprise me. What I'm saying is, there is no scripture that predicts one. All the prophecies of a rebuilt temple in the Old Testament were made by prophets prior to the building of the second temple. There are no prophecies of a rebuilt physical temple in the New Testament. As we have seen, God's temple in the New Testament is his people. Christians are the temple of the living God. He's not going to forsake us for a pile of stones. If the Jews or Catholics or dispensationalists or whoever build a temple in Jerusalem, they do so in vain. God is not moving into it. Well, I don't think I've 
said much about Acts 15:17. It simply tells us why God is setting up the tabernacle of David. It is so that the rest of mankind, the Gentiles, might seek after the Lord and call upon his name. Of course, as we have seen, the Gentiles were the problem this conference in Jerusalem was addressing. Gentiles coming into the church was something the Jewish believers had not expected. When they did, there were those Jews who wanted to enslave them with the Jewish law. But out of the many Old Testament prophecies about Gentiles coming to know God, James specifically chose the prophecy of the rebuilding of the tabernacle of David to back up the decision not to bring those new Gentile believers under unnecessary bondage. All of us who have come to Christ have done so by grace and through faith. The work of Christ on our behalf was costly and intricate, as was the tabernacle of Moses. But for us there is a simplicity when we are brought to Christ, as is demonstrated by the tabernacle of David. We become the habitation of God, being granted His Spirit to live in us. Our response is that of God's Spirit in us. Love, joy, adoration, peace. The delight in God that David experienced when he brought the ark of God, the presence of God, to his simple tent. In Acts 13, we have the narrative of Paul and Barnabas in Antioch. The Jews were not responding to the gospel. Paul rebuked them, telling them that they had proved themselves unworthy of eternal life and that he was turning to the Gentiles. Then in verse 47, he quotes a messianic prophecy from Isaiah 49, 6, and tells the Gentiles that Christ is to be a light to the Gentiles for salvation to the ends of the earth. And the, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, they were rejoicing, they were glorifying the word of the Lord. Now these Gentiles knew nothing of the tabernacle of David, but all of them that were so ordained believed and entered into it. And they were happy about it. How many of you knew you were entering the tabernacle of David when you were saved? Likely none of us. Such is the grace and work of God on our behalf. There was joy and gladness in the presence of the Lord at David's tabernacle. I think a good New Testament corollary to that is seen in Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 19 and 20. Biblical truth set to music is a mark of the Christian. It is to be expressed both outwardly to others and inwardly to God. It is simply an outworking of the Spirit of God in us. True worship in the heart, or the innermost part of man, is powered by the Holy Spirit. Jesus told the Samaritan woman, this is in John chapter 4, verse 23, that true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and truth, and that the Father is seeking people like that to worship him. So, in brief, what is the tabernacle of David? Before saying, there is the picture of God having many tabernacles as we saw in Psalm 46. These tabernacles are the same picture as the dwelling places or rooms in God's house that we saw in John 14 too. And this is like each separate believer being a temple as seen in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. God dwells or lives in each Christian individually. But the tabernacle of David appears to picture all believers collectively. Christ has set this tabernacle up and is now building it as each of the elect come to him. When all God's people are saved, the tabernacle will be completed. It is and will be the eternal habitation of God. God's people collectively are seen in other pictures such as the temple of God. There are other aspects with regard to the tabernacle of David. Jesus Christ sits on the throne of David there. He is king over his people, and they, his subjects, serve him. David's original tabernacle was home to the Ark of the Covenant, or the presence of God. The fulfillment of that is King Jesus reigning in and among his people in the new tabernacle of David. But beyond that, the tabernacle of David pictures proper worship. Those who are part of it are indwelt by the Spirit of God. And thus they love God and praise Him and rejoice in Him and find their soul delight in Him. He is their object of worship and adoration. Like David did, they find in His presence fullness of joy. Question. Is the tabernacle of David the same as the tabernacle of God? 
Yeah, I think that is apparent. The tabernacle of God is found in Revelation 21.3. John heard the great voice out of heaven saying that the tabernacle of God is with men, that he will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God would be with them and be their God. Here we have the similar picture of God dwelling with his people. Whether the picture presented is the church or kingdom or temple or tabernacle, it is of God dwelling in and with his people. This is intimate and precious. This is of God. Do not take this lightly. Take it to heart. None of the counterfeit religious systems around us have any concept of this. Satan tries to mimic it through demon possession. But God does not possess us in such a way. He dwells in us. And in dwelling in us, he gives us life, his life, and liberty. That liberty being the ability to love and obey him as we should. How mercifully and kindly he works with us. So let me give you my paraphrase of Acts 15, 14 through 17. Peter has told how God is coming to the Gentiles to take out from them a people for his name. And the prophets agree with this, having written about it. And then James quotes Amos. After Israel is scattered, I will turn about, and the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down and been ruined, I will rebuild it and set it up again. And having done so, the rest of mankind may seek me, even the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does these things. The scripture is a marvel in itself. It is so interwoven that word pictures can be compared and it seems that shadows and the realities can never be exhausted. Although I have been all over the place in this and may be somewhat disjointed, I think I have said all and even more than I intended to say. But for further study, I would direct you to the book, The Hope of Israel, What Is It? I highly recommend this. It is written by Philip Morrow in the early 1900s. You can search for it and find it online for free. He has a chapter on the Tabernacle of David, but the whole book is really interested. Fare you well in Jesus.